Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Christine Wallach, and I'm a trustee at the American Academy. And on behalf of Terry McCarthy, uh, president of the American Academy, who unfortunately could not be here with us tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, evening's public policy lecture by our fellow Mark Schwartz. Mark holds the Bosch Fellowship in Public Policy, which has been made possible by the generosity of the Robert Bosch Foundation, uh, which has been supporting the American Academy from its inception in the 90s uh, until today. Mark is Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia, the state I come from as well, and an economic historian who studies how state and markets interact, how they're constituted, and how they play off against each other. He's published extensively on developments in the global economy, on globalization, and on the politics of the mortgage market and the mortgage crisis, which was the focus of his path-breaking book called Subprime Nation, American Power, Global Finance, and the Housing Bubble. His more recent work focuses on the political economy of the knowledge economy. At the academy here, Mark is studying the economic and social factors that may be driving the increase in nationalist anti-immigrant political parties in wealthy OECD countries on both sides of the Atlantic. Tonight, he'll explore some of the economic drivers of populist politics. As those of you who've been here before know, uh, we have a lecture, and then we'll have time for questions and answers uh, after the lecture, and time for further conversation in the living room next door over a glass of wine or juice, if that's what you prefer. So over to you, Mark. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Bach. Um, I'd also like to thank the American Academy for bringing me over here and allowing me the privilege of having breakfast with this beautiful view every morning. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, the Bosch Stiftung um, uh, for making excellent anti-lock brakes that have um, helped me out in many situations since I tend to drive a little too fast. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk today um, a lot about the information economy and a bit about how that connects to the rise of anti-establishment parties. Um, and uh, the first uh, most important thing to know um, is uh, what Max Weber uh, taught us many years ago. And since none of you have the patience to read the full 1,200 pages of Economy and Society, um, I, and I only did because I had three months of unemployment before graduate school, um, I'll give you the one-sentence summary that Randall Collins made. So Randall Collins' one-sentence summary of Max Weber is that all religion is about economics, all economics is about politics, and all politics is about religion. <laughs> and so I, and I want to substitute for religion emotion, because I think that's actually what he meant. And the reason I start with this is because I'm going to talk a lot about the economics here, um, and I don't want you to get the idea that this is the only or the complete explanation for the rise of anti-establishment parties. Much of it is about emotional things, um, and in particular, um, uh, uh, relative status in society, identity, hierarchies of race um, and uh, gender. And so um, what we know first and foremost is that this is not new. We have, we have seen this before. And... Um, for those of you who haven't seen the movie 300, which is a horrible movie, um, I would say if you really want to understand the psychology of um, the marginal Trump voter, okay, the ones who are motivated by um, a combination of emotional and economic um, uh, anger, um, you should go see this movie. It's probably on Netflix. If it's not on Netflix, there's DVDs floating around, probably in some market somewhere, pirated. Um, and you'll, you'll see the emotional side. And I'm going to start there because we're going to move away from that. But the emotional side matters. And in this movie, what you see is a group of very beefcakey men uh, with weapons, Greeks, um, defending Sparta from uh, the Persians. And our, our 300 uh, valiant Greek uh, warriors um, uh, are, of course, uh, quite uh, white or European-looking, very beefy, although the modal Trump voter is actually a bit overweight. Um, <laughs> embedded in a rural society in which there's a very clear gender hierarchy. Okay? And they're defending their families from the oncoming horde 
of um, Persians who are multicultural, a bit effeminate, definitely darker, depending on which characters you see, uh, a bit Asiatic, um, urban. So the very an- the antithesis of this. So that's the emotional content that drives a lot of this. Um, at least certainly in America. I, I can't speak for Europe. I don't uh, understand European psychology, so um, I won't make a big claims, but this is the uh, Trump voter. So I, I, I say, have a look at that. That's the emotional side. Um, but of course, this is not an American phenomenon. We have um, a lot of unhappiness, a lot of anti-establishment parties, because there's been a really um, long period of, sus- of sustained uh, weak economic performance and an erosion of income in some cases or very slow growth in income uh, for people, and this is the critical part of the sentence, for people who expected they would do better. Okay, In most cases, we're not talking about people at the very bottom of society. We're talking about people who are around the middle or just above who thought they would do better. Okay, And that's uh, paralleled also by people who think they should do better because they're young and haven't quite entered the labor market and are anxious about that. And that gives you both a left and a right populism or a left and a right um, uh, anti-establishment uh, movement, which um, at its extreme uh, can become uh, violent. And the reason that I care about this, the reason I write about this, is because um, we've seen this movie before, and it was a movie with a very uh, unhappy set of endings, um, most of you are, are European, but this is Minneapolis in the 19, uh, late 1920s. Um, and this, of course, is uh, your hometown uh, in the 1930s. So I, I worry about this and I write about this because um, it's quite possible we have bad things coming out of it. So, so how did we get to this bad situation? Um, we got to this bad situation because there's been a massive change in corporate strategy and structure from what the economy looked like in the 1960s, 70s, to what we have now. And that massive change in corporate strategy and structure has very little to do with the actual production of things. So I'm going to take you back for a little journey through history so that you can understand what I'm talking about when I talk about changes in strategy and structure. So here's what the inside of a car factory looked like in the US in the 1960s. Right? It's exactly what we imagine when we think of a car factory. Assembly line, a bunch of guys putting cars together. But of course, all around them is a whole set of ancillary activities that support that. There's logistics, there's engineers, um, there's accountants. We can go down the whole list, okay? And people looked at that and they said, hmm, this is interesting. We can look at this, uh, this kind of economy. We can write about it and analyze it. And when we look at that economy, what we see is an economy with a high level of planning by corporations, a high level of planning by the state, and a division between two kinds of firms, big high-profit firms and mostly smaller low-profit firms. Um, and uh, since uh, this is a, a transcontinental, uh, uh, sorry, transatlantic uh, um, uh, group and a transatlantic setting, um, here's the European version, uh, which came out in 1965, uh, Andrew Schoenfeld. The academics uh, uh, here uh, probably recognize this. That's the American version. Um, uh, Galbraith talked about the techno structure. He expected it would last forever. Schoenfeld wasn't quite as sure. And in fact, as both of these people were writing, it started to fall apart. So in the old days, that's production, right? Assembly lines, engineers, logistics, caterers, security people. When we get to the modern world, actually, nothing's changed physically. So here's your local heroes, right? We still have a bunch of guys putting cars together. Um, I don't have pictures of logistics inside car factories, but here's modern logistics. You can start to see some changes, right? And you can see the changes here. They're making electrical motors for electrical cars. They have um, some robots and a lot of barcoding, but it's still basically logistics. And then, of course, there's engineers. And there's still a low-wage segment. So if you walk into a car factory today, you're going to see almost exactly the same things you saw in the past, physically almost exactly the same things you saw in the past physically. The differences are there's more information technology, there's more robots, but it's the same people doing the same jobs. The big difference is where we draw the legal boundaries around those people. 
In the 1960s version, the legal boundary of the firm went around almost all of these people. And that mattered. Corporate strategy and structure in that period was something like this. We're a firm. We want to capture oligopoly profits for the civilians here, profits that come from the fact that we can control the flow of our product into the market and price it above uh, what would be a competitive price. We control that flow because we control the physical capital that's used to make those products. And we do this in a vertically integrated firm in which we sit, take some of those extra profits and we redistribute them to this large number of people that are inside the firm because the only way we can make this production system work is to have labor peace. So these firms made big profits, but they redistributed them over a very large headcount. And these firms made big profits, but because they were building things with physical machines and machines wear out, they had to do a lot of investment to keep that control over their physical capital. And so you have an economy in which there's a lot more of an even income distribution. Uh, and for, again, for the economists in the audience, um, and for the rest of you, you can just ignore this, but for the economists in the audience, if we think about GDP as C plus G plus I, don't worry about net exports, consumption, government transfers, investment, Consumption was higher because there was a more equal distribution of income. Investment was higher because you were replacing all of this equipment. And of course, because you could see the factory making the things, it was easy for the government to tax. Um, for the non-economists, General Motors, Volkswagen in the 1960s. General Motors, 600,000 employees in a population that was 200 million in the US at that time. So a substantial portion of the workforce inside one firm. Um, General Motors, 70% of the value it produced was created in-house. That's what vertical integration means. Most of what they're doing is done in-house, big labor, headcount. Okay? That's the old economy. Here's the new economy, different legal boundaries. In the new economy, the same things are going on, but we draw the legal boundary differently. You walk into the car factory, you see people on the assembly line, in the US, about 20 to 25% of these people are contract workers. They're not legally inside the firm. They're hired from an outside subcontractor. Catering, security, logistics, we can go down the list. They're all working for some other firm. The automobile company is making OK these days, just OK profits. And I'll say why in a minute or two, but just OK profits. And it still has to redistribute those profits over its remaining employees. But the number of employees in the firm, in the legal sense of the firm, much smaller. So General Motors today, 200,000 people. And that's not just because they lost market share. It's because, remember that 70% of value creation internally? They spun a lot of that out. It's a different firm now. The people who were catering for them in the 1960s contracted in now. Okay. So there's much less redistribution of profits from those firms. So you will, of course, ask the question, where's the money going? And again, those of you who know something about what's been happening in the economy know that the wage share, the labor share of GDP has fallen over the last 30 years. And so you might ask, great, there's, there's obviously more profit being captured by firms because if the labor share goes down, the profit share goes up. Um, where's, where's that money going? And the answer is the money is going to a, a set of firms that have a different corporate strategy and structure. The corporate strategy is capture monopoly profits by controlling intellectual property rights. Intellectual property rights are things like patents, copyright, trademark, brands. Capture monopoly profits using intellectual property rights inside a firm whose legal boundaries have a much smaller human head count, many fewer workers, workers with very high levels of human capital. Okay, And attach yourself to a production chain, a supply chain, a commodity chain, in which there are strict legal boundaries between all the people, all the firms that are bringing inputs into the final product. And that supply chain looks something like this. These are, because I started with Max Weber, these are ideal types. Very few firms in the real world, world look exactly like this. 
but we can use this as a way to think about them. So in the new world, the new economy, instead of having a bunch of big firms like GM and a bunch of small firms with lower profits, and you won't even know the names, so I won't mention them, we have three different kinds of firms. And at the top, in terms of profit, um, so this is uh, profits over here and, and headcount over there, at the top in terms of profit are these firms that have successfully created monopolies um, around intellectual property rights. They tend to have very small headcounts. They tend um, uh, to have very high profits, and I'll give you some numbers labor, later. And if you uh, want some names, these are obviously firms like Apple, which has about, theoretically has about 90,000 employees, but only 30,000 that are actually full-time regular employees. The rest are those people you meet in the genius bars. And they're on temporary contracts. Firms like Qualcomm, which is about 30,000 people. Firms like Facebook, which is 30, 36,000 people. And these are big firms in this sector. These are big firms in this sector. Before Instagram was bought, it had fewer than 10 employees. Um, Instagram for you old folks is something the young folks use. Don't worry. <laughs> it's very popular. So that's the top of the, pyram the upside down pyramid in terms of profits. In the middle, you have firms that still make things, and they usually make things in a physical capital intensive way. So car companies, the semiconductor fabrication firms, which could be hybrids like Intel, which actually has a very a bit of the top part also, or pure play firms like Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturer. All they do is make chips for people. It's a very capital intensive business. A semiconductor fabrication plant these days, if you want a state-of-the-art fab, $10 billion investment. That's about 9 billion euro. So some of us have that kind of money. Like every time I reach into my pocket, I come up with an extra billion. It's not a problem for me to build the, one of these. But a lot of firms, they're nervous about doing that. And there's a, that makes a barrier to entry. So they make OK profits because there's a barrier to entry there. Making cars, also, still a very difficult business, as Elon Musk has learned. <laughs> Not as simple as it seems. There's a barrier to entry. But as we get to the bottom of this group, you start to have more and more firms where the barrier to entry in terms of the complexity of the product you're making or the capital investment you need to make gets smaller and smaller. And so there's more and more pressure on profits. But as a general rule, profits here are kind of in the middle compared to the people at the top. And at the bottom are firms that are labor intensive, typically low skill. Um, and they're the ones who are doing all the the dirty work. They're the ones actually like Han High Precision, Foxconn, which I uh, showed you the picture of a few slides ago, that put things together. They're the people who clean floors, do security, um, uh, teach your yoga classes, um, bring you your lunch uh, when you're when your high human capital firm uh, orders lunch in to keep you at work um, uh, uh, at your law firm or at your, uh, your software uh, firm. And they make very uh, small profits. In terms of volume of profits, the highest volume is, um, is up at the top and the lowest volume is at the bottom. Now, for those of you who like words instead of pictures, because there's two kinds of people in the world, <laughs> Those who like words, those who like pictures. And actually, there's three. And then there's me. I like words and pictures. But um, here's the same thing with words. And I give you some examples of firms. And I give you some examples of firms because in our heads, I think we tend to think about the new economy as being a tech economy. And that's correct, right? You can see what I'm talking about by going down the list here, Apple, Samsung, Foxconn, right? All we do up here, sorry for you Apple fan folks, all they do is make software and the design of the phone. Everything that goes into the phone that's physical is made by somebody else. I call out Samsung here, but it's also Toshiba, Local Hero STM, Microelectronics, micro um, uh, Corning, which makes the glass. Okay? And then at the bottom, Foxconn, a Taiwanese firm operating in uh, China that puts the things together, lots of hands. We tend to think about that as the archetypical firm, and it is archetypical. But it's not all that's going on. Um, it's also something as low tech as firms that rely on brands. So here's another set of, oh, and I, yeah, another set of firms called out in red. Hilton, it's a brand manager. Hilton sold 
it, almost all of its last remaining physical hotel buildings in 2015. So here's Hilton. Here's Hilton. It's a collection of brands. They've carefully segmented the market. Short stay, long stay, people who are willing to spend $300, people willing to spend $250, and so on down the line. It's a very small firm in terms of its human headcount right now. What do those employees look like? They're designing brand, they're doing PR, <coughs> they're managing the image. They make pretty good money. The company makes pretty good money. The same thing is true in Europe. This is actually at the other end of the spectrum. Accor still owns about half of its properties. Only 50% are franchised. Hilton franchises its names to somebody else. Accor, 50%. Who's the somebody else? The somebody else, for the most part, is people who own buildings. Only 20% roughly, that's, whoops, that's this bit of the pie here, is a hotel owner, operator, the brand owner actually operating the hotel. The rest is somebody else. It's your um, rich second generation uh, criminal family friends <laughs> <laughs> who are in real estate. No, it's real estate investment trusts. It's um, actually old, old money, um, old, old money uh, uh, that owns you know, real estate. And um, these are the people in that middle slice. They own the physical building. They own the big chunk of physical capital. It's hard to replicate that. It's hard to put up a new hotel building in the middle of a city. It's expensive. So they can make some okay profits. And so here's the other Apple, not the phone company. This is the company that licenses the brand from, among others, Hilton and Marriott. And as you can see in the lower bit there, they, they um, are responsible for 3% of um, Hilton and Marriott upscale, meaning that's the $300, $400 a night, and middle to upscale, $250 a night, hotel rooms in the US. And you can see they're very uh, ecumenical. Hilton, Marriott, we don't care what label we put on our hotel as long as you come there. What they care about is that the brand is good, of course. So when you walk into these hotels, you think you're walking into a Hilton or you think you're walking into a Marriott, but you might be walking into an, an Apple hospitality hotel. And of course you come in and you walk up to the counter and you make a big smile because you're happy to be out of the taxi and the airplane and all that. And the nice person behind the counter says, hello, Mr. Schwartz, we're so happy to have you here. And you think there's a genuine human interaction going on. <laughs> and they're reading from a script provided by the brand owner. And they follow the script always because that's a condition of employment. A condition of employment and they follow it because they know they can be fired very easily because most of those are contract workers. The really important people from the point of view of the hotel building owner, the head chef, the head of security, the night and day managers, a few other people, they're employed by that middle level firm. But the rest of those folks are typically employees of um, hospitality services, ADECO, other suppliers, Manpower, Ronstadt, other suppliers of labor. And they're not paid very well. And especially in the US, where we have zero social protection for people at the bottom, they're uh, not paid at all, often. Um, and so uh, they try to unionize and go on strike. Okay. So that's the new economy. The new economy is not big firms, little firms, physical capital versus everybody else. The new economy is this tripartite division. And that has a lot of different consequences that I'm going to talk about in terms of electoral politics in the US and other places. Um, and then I'll come back and show you some numbers uh, that relate to the economy. But before we do that, I want to make sure you really believe me, because I think you know there's reason to be skeptical about this. And I, I know that you'll really, really believe me, because you do know in your heart of hearts that this is true. And the reason you know that is that the arbiter of all social value in our society has decided it must be true. And of course, that arbiter is the stock market. Okay, I know you guys, humanists, you <laughs> other things, but, and actually, uh, sometimes in the middle of the night, I wake up sweating, and I think it can't just all be equities. Um, 
Uh, but it is a social, this is a social fact, right? This is a kind of dominant reality in our society. So what does the stock market tell us? The stock market says, here at the end of that physical capital era, this blue bar, tangible assets, stuff you could touch, accounted for about 83% of the capitalization uh, of, the S of the 500 largest firms in the U.S., the S&P 500, Standard & Poor's 500. So a bit over 80% is physical capital. Today, it's this red bar, intangible assets, are a bit around 85% of stock market capitalization. What the stock market is saying is, we think shares of Apple are worth not anymore $1,000 a share. It used to be easier to remember the number. It's gone down a little bit, but don't worry. <laughs> they have ways of bringing it back. Um, what, what is that? It's not factories. Apple doesn't own factories. It's very little physical equipment. They do have a lot of high-powered computing equipment because designing new software does require physical equipment. And also, Apple is now worried about losing too much control to Intel and Samsung. And they're starting to do some of their own chip design. And that takes a lot of computing power. But if you looked at Apple and said, Apple... Um, What's Apple worth? It's not worth uh, uh, close to a trillion dollars in terms of stock market capitalization because it has physical capital. It's worth close to a thousand dollars because they've got a monopoly on a whole bunch of things, stupid things in some cases. So those of you might remember there was a lawsuit between Apple and Samsung, and I don't have my favorite uh, prop here, which is my phone, but we'll pretend it's a phone. One of the things Ap Apple sued Samsung and said, we have a patent on things that are really crucial to the iPhone. And Samsung's violating those patents. And so we want you, the US court, to bar Samsung from exporting smartphones to the US. That's one of the ways you keep a monopoly. And one of those patents was on slide to unlock. And all of you, having grown up uh, of modest means and made successes of yourself, well, remember the days when you used to lock the bathroom door by sliding that little bolt over, right? So this is not some amazing invention that <laughs> Apple sweated blood to create. They, and you are, of course, again, be thinking, this, this guy Schwartz. But, but, but because they do, um, you know, the Apple experience actually is good. They do spend a lot of time actually generating new stuff that is interesting and useful. But... Because they have a patent on that slide to unlock feature and some other things uh, that they sued Samsung over, this is how they keep their monopoly. They can use litigation to keep people out of the market. And so what the stock market says is Apple's got a lot of patents they can use to litigate competitors out of the market with. And so we know they're going to keep getting high levels of profit. Or to give you another example, Qualcomm has a patent on the technology that connects your cell phone to the tower. So every phone in the world, asterisk, except those sold in China the, by firms that are just making phones, firms making phones and not playing by the rules, every phone in the world has this Qualcomm technology in it, and their patent prevents other people from replicating that, and Qualcomm collects approximately $10 uh, from every phone on the basis of that patent. Apple's actually suing Qualcomm over this right now. So there's fights over this. But the market is saying, this is what we value. Okay. Now, again, um, because some of you are German and, and you think this is all nonsense, the real economy is the car industry. <laughs> and I will be very careful here. These are just numbers. You can interpret them any way you want. Okay. Here's Das Auto. And by the way, a very important qualifier here. The data I'm using is data for public, mostly for public firms. So privately held firms like, thank you, Bosch, um, they don't show up in this data. So you won't see Bosch here. But if we take the four big publicly uh, held firms, BMW, Continental, Daimler, Volkswagen, um, the blue bars here are their cumulative profits from 2001 to 2014. Uh, 13 years, 14 years. The red bar is their human head, their labor head count, the average head count over that time period. And you can see BMW makes good bank. 
Everybody wants BMW in the U.S. I don't know why. Continental makes tires. They don't make such good bank. Tires are actually kind of generic. Daimler, VAG. So there's the big four German auto firms, MSFT. That's Microsoft. So here's Microsoft's cumulative profits in this time period. That's their human capital headcount. And so there's Microsoft. And then to make it easy, that's the big four added up. So Microsoft's profits over this time period, roughly the same as the profits of the big four with a tenth of the labor headcount. Everybody with me? That's why I say we have these three layers. And so here's where you see the consequences, right? Microsoft makes big profits. And one of the things that firms do is they will redistribute those profits inside the firm. There's sociological reasons for that, about pay parities. There's economic reasons about keeping the labor you want to keep. Um, and there's often uh, collective bargaining reasons. But they will redistribute those profits. But if you're redistributing the profits over a smaller headcount of people, many fewer people are going to get that money. And if you're redistributing it over a workforce that has mostly high human capital employees, they're going to get a lot of money, right? But that money doesn't turn into investment. When, uh, sorry, this is the obligatory shout out of the proud father. When my software engineer daughter gets the big salary, right? What she does with it is enter the overheated housing market in Boston and pay for approximately uh, 110 square meters what I paid for my 270 square meter single family house nestled in the woods. Hers is on a somewhat busy street. It's noisy, right? I, I live in a part of the US nobody wants to come to anymore. but. Um, <laughs> No, actually, it's quite desirable. So I mean, this number, if, you were, if I was really in an undesirable place, the number would be even worse. But, so these people get a lot of money, but it doesn't turn into investment. It turns into, um, into uh, upward pressure on positional goods, real estate, nice breakfasts, yoga instructors. OK? OK, so great for them. Not so great for the folks who work in these kinds of businesses. As I say, in the US, where this process has gone on longer and farther, and where unions are weaker, and where social protection is weaker, firms have responded by casualizing what we used to think of as core employees. They've spun out the low-value-added stuff. So corporate strategy and structure. If you're one of those kinds of firms, what do you do? Well, you could try to become one of those superstar firms at the top which would be a strategy that a firm like Bosch might, em might employ. Let's not make things anymore, but we'll make software for things, and we'll make it in a very sophisticated way, Industry 4.0. But if you're not Bosch, if you're making dumb brakes, if you're making windshield wipers, if you're making car seats, then you're going to start to think about keeping your profits up by um, weakening, um, weakening uh, lowering your um, labor costs. And that's easy to do in the US because we have no unions. It's harder here. But it is a strategy. And so we can say, you know, here's two corporate strategies. And then here's um, three more about uh, what you do if you can't do the first one, right? So you can try and become a monopoly firm. Not everybody uh, gets to do that. Many are called. Few are chosen. <laughs> if you can't do that, you could try to get some kind of functional monopoly by being the dominant producer of tires or the dominant producer of car seats. Um, and that's been happening. Uh, and if you can't do that, then you send your work off to low-wage countries if it doesn't have a time-sensitive component. So you can go to China, the East, right? If you have access to a rural labor market, you can go to a rural labor, rural labor market. That's a, a, actually a dominant US strategy. Or you contract workers in. And it's these things that have produced the destruction of life chances for the middle. And I say the middle because the immigrants that have come in, of course, are coming from poor places. From their point of view, coming to the US or coming to Europe, even if it's into what we think of as a low-wage job, this is great from their point of view. Life is better here. Okay. Um, but these other things have put downward pressure uh, on the middle um, and the lower, lower middle, if you want. And we see that in the aggregate numbers. 
So this is um, income gains indexed to 100. So arbitrarily, we say it's 185 for the 17 rich countries that we have numbers for. And what you see is the top has done great. The bottom uh, in the OECD 17 has done OK. If I just put the US here, the number, the line would go like that. Um, and the middle has done kind of middling, which is the replication of this industrial structure. Since you're curious about uh, what's going on locally, these are the numbers for Germany, 1995 to 2015. Percentage change in real wages broken up by decile, bottom 10% to the top 10%. Okay. Um, what does this do politically? Okay. The question about what this does politically is, here's where you find in here, in the middle, here's where you find um, anger about, about how things are playing out. And um, so here's the numbers for the US broken out a different way. So critically, right, bottom 10% of the male population, bottom 50th percentile of the male population, 1979 to 2017, real wages have gone down. So if we think about, again, a psychology, uh, you know, I am a white person um, where wages have gone up a bit, but not so much in the, the bottom and the middle. I'm a white person. At some point, I expected I would be in the one-third of American white households that have incomes over $100,000, about 90,000 euro. That's where you expect to be. That's, your, that's aspirational. They're just not making it. Typical Trump voter is making around 70,000 US dollars. From a point of view of US median, they're above the median, they're above the average, but they didn't make it. So it makes them unhappy. And what they see, by contrast, is men, right? Oh, wow, w women have done much better. That's not the way it's supposed to work, right? I mean, they're supposed to be home taking care of me. They're not supposed to be out making money. I definitely don't want my household standard of living to depend too much on them. It gives them too much power. So that's an unhappiness. And what they also see is not this, but this. Because what they see is what they see on TV. The modal Trump voter is in a part of the country that's white. I do volunteer work down in southwest Virginia in a county called Lee County. Lee County in the census is 94% white. When I do the volunteer work, uh, the first time I went down there, I'm looking around and I, and I said to the person who runs the waterworks, is there supposed to be 5 or 6% black people here, but I don't see any black people at all. And I would think that they would be poor and therefore they would be coming to this free clinic. And the engineer said, oh, you, you looked at the census numbers, right? And, he, and I go, yeah. And he says, that 5%, they're in the prison over there, <laughs> right? So when these people in rural America are looking at black people, what they're seeing is black people on TV, basketball players. They've got a lot of money. Or they see TV productions in which there has been a normalization of representation. And TV, of course, only puts people only gives you pictures of people with lots of money. So this is what produces the anger. This, this drop and this uh, slow growth is a product of these corporate strategies. So before I talk about that, I have to dismiss an argument that's often put out, which is that we're not seeing what you're talking about, Schwartz. What we're seeing is a shift to high technology and so, of course, there's more demand for skilled workers. And so, of course, people with higher educations get bigger salaries. That's just the way the market works. There's no geographic component to this, right? And that's, to a certain extent, true, right? I mean, if we do these same numbers, but we break it out by education, advanced degrees, big increase in wages, wow, low education, falling. And again, in that middle, right, some college, most Americans don't have a college education, uh, also negative, right? If this were true, we'd expect to see um, less of a correlation of this with the manufacturing. And you, you don't see that. What you see is this, right? What you see is a concentration of highly educated people in a handful of metropolitan areas. So all of this color, I guess, lavender, um, Men only have four colors, five colors, black, white, red, green, blue. Um, 
but I guess lavender. Um, that's the average level of education is high school. This darker green, forest green, there's urban America. Okay, and what is in urban America? Companies like Microsoft, companies like uh, Qualcomm in San Diego down there. Um, in my uh, favorite place in the world, not really, but favorite place in the world, Philadelphia, uh, Vanguard, a huge financial services firm, lots of programmers, General Electric nuclear power engineering, lots of engineers, right? That's where the value is being created in the economy. All this out here, high school education, that's also where manufacturing is now in the U.S. And that's where it is because that's where all those firms that didn't have the $10 billion fabrication, semiconductor fabrication barrier to entry have gone in search of cheap labor. So here's America's manufacturing belt, the old manufacturing belt and the new one in the South. Um, and what's happened there, of course, is firms move there because they can become a monopolist in the labor market. And um, because you also have Chinese competition, um, you have a loss of employment. And what you're seeing right in here are low-wage, labor-intensive firms, furniture textiles that are destroyed by Chinese imports. And what you will see in a minute up here is the more recent version of that because the Chinese have moved up market and also because automation has destroyed jobs. And so you see employment falling uh, after the, sh uh, the, um, the, uh, the 2008 crisis. Um, and here you see employer monopoly. Red here means there's basically one dominant employer per county. You want a good job with the good firm, you've got one choice. This means they can push wages down. The analyses that other people have done suggest roughly a 20% depression in uh, wages on account of this monopsony. And people respond to this, meaning people means here the marginal, male tr the marginal Trump voter who is male, lower education, older, also sicker, um, uh, and more religious. They respond to this destruction of their life chances. So they were already doing this before the 2016 election. This is the shift in vote share from 2004 to 2012, which is when Chinese um, uh, exports to the US start shifting from clothing and shoes. Those industries were already gone by 2004 to things like cheap car parts, furniture. Um, this area right here had a lot of furniture manufacturing, all gone, okay? And they, these people responded by voting for the Republican Party. Um, and then post-crisis and also the beginning of Chinese penetration into uh, more serious manufacturing industries. This is a little harder to read, but um, that's this upper Midwest manufacturing, car manufacturing. And there the response is, uh, I've lost my job because the um, car companies are shifting production to Mexico or I've lost my job because they automated it away, or I've lost my job because they're using contract workers instead of hiring full-time workers, okay? Um, and this, pro this produced this Republican shift. And critically for Trump, which I don't want to talk too much about because we've had a nice dinner, um, <laughs> that gave victories in these, that, those marginal voters gave victories in these states. Florida, as we always say in the US, is exceptional. It's a crazy place. Nothing ever goes right in Florida. Okay. Just to give you a few more things, the correlation between voting Democrat, voting Republican is very tightly connected to where value and therefore employment is created. The blue circles here are um, on uh, counties that voted Democrat. The red ones are counties that voted uh, Republican. This is the, GDP, the share of growth in the American economy during the recovery. So, you know, here's Los Angeles, right? So Los Angeles is the size of the Netherlands in terms of uh, population. It's uh, uh, the size of Canada in terms of its economy. So it's not surprising that it's a big chunk, but you know, it, it also is responsible for a lot of growth. And they vote Democrat. And then Lafayette Parish, this is an interesting county for those of you who are pessimists, and a reassuring county for those of you that are optimists. Um, it voted for Trump in 2016. But that county is part of a congressional district that just elected a Democrat. Probably because Trump 
quite visibly has not solved their, their problems. Okay, so that's the wage side of it. People's incomes have gone down. I want to say a little bit about investment because investment matters. So here's some numbers for the top 100 firms in terms of cumulative gross profit, 1992 to 2017. This is out of the CompuStat database. There are 22,000 plus or minus unique firms in the database uh, over the whole uh, period. So we're talking about a very small percentage of firms. Okay, this is the top 100. And I've just aggregated them into these arbitrary categories, but IPR-based, this is pharmaceuticals, software, technology hardware like Intel, um, franchise businesses like McDonald's, they're a brand owner, hotels, they're like, uh, they're brand owners. Um, finance is what it sounds like, other is a residual category, it's a bunch of different things, manufacturing, and then oil. And oil's there because in the 1950s, 60s, oil's, oil would be this bar. So I have this there for comparison, but I don't have that slide. So you can see these, the IP-based firms in the, the top 100 firms are getting about 15% of all profits of all firms, that's the 22,000 number in the database. It's a disproportionate share. That would be okay if they took that money and then turned it in some, into some kind of demand in the economy. It would be okay if they had a lot of employees and they turned it into wages. It would be okay if they turned it into capital expenditure, investment. It's, you know where I'm going, right? Okay, yeah, I don't have no, no surprises. Okay, so this is the share of capital expenditures. And you can see the disproportions here. Now, these numbers, right, they're not strictly speaking equivalent because capital expenditure is typically less than gross profits. Um, but the number you would want to think about here is that these firms are spending about 16% of gross profit on capital expenditure. And remember, this column includes firms like Intel. They've got a big physical capital footprint. They're spending about 16% of gross profits. Manufacturing firms are spending about 30% of gross profits. Oil firms, about 40% of gross profits. The US average is around 22%. So these firms are underinvesting relative to their profit share. And that's the problem in the larger economy also. Less investment means less growth. Less growth means people's life chances don't look good. When people's life chances don't look good, they can get angry. Um, and anger, as, as uh, Darth Vader would tell you, um, uh, anger uh, quickly leads to the dark side. Okay. So um, thanks for your patience. Um, happy to take uh, questions. My esteemed... My esteemed colleague will uh, call out, since I'm incompetent. Yes, questions. A very provocative, uh, thought-provoking and provocative yeah. talk. Uh, thank you for that. I wonder if you want to keep this slide up. <laughs> 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 but I think the point is, yes, time for questions. Um, and um, maybe we take two questions at a time, and then you can... Uh, synthesize the answer. Uh, so who would like to ask a question? Um, okay, so start here and we'll go... Ah, okay, sorry, fair enough, by all means. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm Prerna Singh, fortunate to be Mark's fellow fellow in the from the Bosch Institute. So, I mean, such a powerful talk, but because it's so powerful, Mark, um, also so depressing. And so I was wondering if you could start us off by saying, so if there is this kind of, I think, quite convincing relationship between this change in economic structure and then a particular disturbing political pattern that we see, given that a lot of the changes that you describe seem to be structural, long-term, and potentially changes that don't seem, we're, we're not going to be returning to General Motors. I mean, we're, I don't know what we're headed towards, but it's clearly not um, what gave rise to a very different kind of politics. Um, so, so how, so what now? How do we kind of, in a way, literally move beyond this slide if what 
if the economic changes you describe are indeed as convincing as you have just shown us in the last 45 okay. minutes. One more question. Yeah, I just add on to that. I really enjoyed your talk a lot because a lot of facts are kind of not talked about in, in my field also. Um, but I'm wondering if the causation might be the following. It's technology happening, weakening the workers' bargaining power because firms can now make themselves very small if they want or make themselves very large if they want, and they can threaten to outsource. So isn't the real problem workers' power, bargaining power? In the 1950s, the United States had powerful unions, minimum wage laws that mattered, and now we don't. Right. So um, let me start by thanking Prina for asking the question. Uh, I, I paid her to ask. Um, <laughs> and uh, over dinner, I threatened to reveal um, Michael's, or Michelle, how do you use, Ms. Michael's uh, uh, excessive drinking habits, uh, unless he asked a similar question. If, if I go right back to that beginning, um, all politics is about religion, all religion is about economics, all economics is about politics. Um, we tend to think about these things as being structural. It's technology driving things. These are inevitable structural changes that we um, uh, have no control over. But um, from my point of view, this is not so. And um, all of these things um, can be mitigated. And from my point of view, mitigation is enough. Right? Politically, what we're talking about is, can you move 5% of people from this column to that column? If you move 5% of people out of Sweden, Democrats, they're no longer the biggest party. If you move 5% of people out of the Republican Party to the Democratic Party, the Republicans don't win elections. If AfD loses 5%, I think at this point they would not fall below the threshold. Is that cor Germans correct me? But they would be closer, right? That's all we're talking about. Just move those 5%. We don't have to make everything perfect. These things are mitigatable by policy. Patents, trademark, copyright, these are politically created things. Their terms can be changed. They have mostly been changed for the worst. So we talk about the Mickey Mouse Copyright Acts in the US, this progressive extension of copyright. It's now 95 years, sometimes a little bit more. Um, it doesn't have to be 95 years. It was originally 28 years, which makes sense. Most of us, unless we're really superstar academics like the rest of the fellows, not me, you know, they don't write their first book till they're um, uh, uh, in their 40s. And so, OK, it gives them a little bit of money to carry into retirement. That makes sense. 95 years makes no sense. 95 years only makes sense in terms of here's a corporate entity that wants to maximize its profits and its share value. Same thing with patents. All these things are open to political contestation. Um, I haven't used the word antitrust yet, but I'll just put out antitrust enforcement matters, right? We could have more of it. It could be more vigorous. The legal structure of responsibility for our employees matters. So in the US, under the Obama administration, the National Labor Relations, and this gets to your point, the National Labor Relations Board said two things. They said, oh, McDonald's, Browning Ferris, Browning Ferris is a, a trash collection company. You've created a structure where here's a low headcount, et cetera, et cetera, corporation at the top, and then there's a set of subcontractors behind, below you, right? McDonald's owns the brands. Here's the franchise owner. Here's the workers in which you're insulated from what happens to those workers. If these workers were employees of McDonald's legally, and McDonald's gave health insurance to its brand managers, designers, et cetera, they'd have to give health insurance to those people. If McDonald's policy on gender discriminations said X, Y, Z, and there's a violation at that level, or there's a violation of federal law around that, McDonald's would be responsible. The National Labor Relations Board said, we think the degree of control that you, Browning Ferris, and you, McDonald's, have over these employees is so high, you are de facto the employee, employer, right? Trump administration got rid of that. But politically, that would have solved part of the problem here. Obama administration said, last comment about this, said uh, over time uh, rules, 
uh, there's actually an income threshold above which you're not uh, eligible for overtime. They wanted to raise that uh, by about 60% from the low 20s to the $40,000 mark. So a lot more people would have been eligible for, um, for salaried yeah, for salaried employees. So all of this is amenable to political action. One final fact, the market distribution of income, meaning what do people get when they walk in the door and they ask for a paycheck and then they go home, market distribution of income in the US, Germany, Sweden, not all that different. What's different is the politics around it, and that does have something to do with the trade unions. The post tax and transfer distribution of income, very different. That's political. My name is Topper Sherwood. Um, I'm German American and um, in the publishing industry, um, uh, which goes to my question. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk. And I, I guess I, it's I, maybe it's more of a comment uh, because uh, I guess I want to encourage you to think more about the publishing uh, industry, the two gorillas in the intellectual property bathtub, which is uh, Google and Amazon. Um, this week, Europe is passing. Uh, legislation that uh, overhauls copyright and is also examining anti -tr linking antitrust to privacy issues. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to me to hear you point your thinking that you've applied to, to Microsoft and, and the car companies, and, et cetera, and Apple, to uh, these two companies, which, you know, Amazon taking so much of the publishing industry, uh, you know, a technology that's 500 years old, uh, both used and uh, new books, uh, and Google, which began its uh, operations by scanning in millions of titles um, and uh, recreating the, the advertising, creating really a new industry of uh, what one writer called surveillance advertising. Uh, which has an effect on magazines and newspapers across the world. Um, so I just, I'd just be curious to hear how you point your, your intellectual gun, if you will, uh, at these two giants that are, that are occupying such a huge intellectual space and, 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 and uh, in industry space uh, in this new industry. Oh. Thank you also very much for the talk. My name is Dieter Pleve from the uh, WZB Social Science Research Institute here in Berlin. I was just wondering, um, I mean, these, these figures are quite impressive in terms of the distribution of the economic activities and the firm types and um, obviously the vote share. Um, and yet I'm wondering why would then these people vote for somebody who is not taking um, taxes from these big firms? I mean, the, there is something that needs explaining um, because that doesn't add up. I mean, this guy is basically um, rhetorically aggressive against Google and others, but he is giving them the biggest tax breaks in history. Sure. Um, so you're you're absolutely correct. Um, uh, life is short, and so I haven't actually done much work on that because I try to get the main message out and get, the, get a book written in a, enough time so I can meet my commitments in 2020 to my very good friend that we should together write a book about something else. But you're absolutely correct. I would encourage you instead to ask Jeanette, and that's the other reason I'm not answering this, to ask Jeanette this question because she actually knows what's going on, um, certainly more than I do. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, what I'll do is, is, is respond to Dieter, and then if you want to say something, I would be happy to let you say something. Um, in terms of Dieter's question, look, it, to, make, to be most charitable, uh, charitable about it, um, we can say there's two different kinds of voters in the Trump coalition, three different kinds. There's people who, um, for whom the, um, the 300 movie, right, racial and gender hierarchies, mean much, much more to them than anything else. They'll take the pocketbook hit um, to, to uh, ha have these policies. And actually, there was a, I think it was a New York Times uh, interview where um, 
uh, uh, the reporter asked someone um, about changes to um, Medicaid rules. Medicaid is public health insurance for poor people and disabled people. Changes to Medicaid rules that had made uh, someone in her family ineligible. And the reporter said, what do you think about this? And the woman said, uh, we weren't supposed to be the people who got hurt here. Okay, So there is some cognitive blindness. And this includes people who employ illegal immigrants in the agricultural industry. There's some cognitive blindness on some people's part. Or, so, you know, again, so much about the emotion. Um, second kind of voter is um, maybe, let's say, more finely balanced between the uh, emotion and the, the, the money. And they're an interesting group. Um, for the most part, um, they're lower educated voters. And I, I do think um, uh, we as academics and as professionals circulate in circles in which we think that she's really smart and I'm almost as smart and he's not quite as smart, but we're talking about the top 5% of the population, right? The average person's average. They don't have a lot of time. Their lives are really stressful. Right? It's not just that they don't have the cognitive ability, they don't have the information feed to make sense of what's going on until after things have happened. People voted for, those people voted for Trump in 2016 because they were angry, justifiably angry. And Trump in 2016 was campaigning on expand Social Security, save Medicare. Right? It was a populist message. Now he turns around and he doesn't deliver that. And so those people may change their mind. And this is, I think, what happened in Parish County, uh, Louisiana, where a Democrat just won a congressional by-election uh, by a narrow majority. But this was a, a, a congressional district that went for Trump by about 30 percentage points. And the last group of people are traditional Republican voters, high-paid people who live in suburbs. And those people, and here's why I say this is the message for optimists uh, and the, the reason pessimists shouldn't go back to the open bar and just... <laughs> drink um, those people just got a tax increase okay I did my taxes before I came here they went up oh he's yeah I'm sober okay <laughs> well you you may want after you talk to your accountant you may want those people got a tax increase they're going to be angry because they thought we're getting a kind of standard Republican here he's going to lower our taxes but he didn't. And we're talking, you know, we're talking to people who are in that $100,000 to say two or $300,000 uh, slice of the world. Um, my, uh, well, again, little kind of reality test. My brother lives in one of those suburbs uh, outside of Philadelphia. Um, uh, he, he makes good buck, good bang, good, good money also. Um, he won't give me any, though. Um, and... Um, they have their elections off cycle from the national elections for local government. The map, sorry, and in the US, red is Republican. We're backwards. Red is Republican, blue is Democrat. The map was red in 2015. In 2017, before the tax increase was felt, but on the basis of other policies, the racial craziness, uh, attacks on uh, science industries and other things, it went from all red to all blue. And so those, those voters are, are likely to, to walk away, at least for the next election. So the answer is partly they didn't know. To the extent that they do know now, they may change their behavior. I don't want to embarrass you or put you on the spot, but you know, if you okay. want. Thank yeah. you for giving me the chance to reply to your question. Um, I'm an internet researcher, just to introduce myself, Janet Hofmann is my name, and I used to work on copyright when copyright hit the internet in the early 2000s, and I also used to work on Google Books and wrote a couple of articles about it. I would say, I would uh, regard this area as one that is gener generically different from what we see, what you call it, uh, surveillance, advertisement, and Shoshana Zuboff in her recently published book called Surveillance Capitalism. I think these are two different stories. The one regarding copyright, I would say, is the, the way I would tell the story, is one of uh, a huge market failure. Um, digitalization would have given us the chance to sort of 
get all the debt works, uh, protected works, onto the market and lead them to a second use. Google Books, uh, the idea of digitalizing all printed works and make them available for people who want to use them was a very good idea. The way it was implemented is horrible, but me as an academic, I rant every day about the fact that it is so difficult to access the works of my colleagues that I don't want to buy, that I might not even want to read, that I, but that I want to assess for the quality, for the value of what I'm doing at the moment. I'm not buying these kind of things. I want to assess them. Informational goods are not goods like any other uh, goods that you buy. You cannot know before you read a book or before you listen to a song whether this is really one to listen to or read to. And that's why it should be treated differently. We need better subscription models, for example. And in a way, um, YouTube got it right with its so-called content ID. Every video uploaded on YouTube has, is marked so that the copyright holder knows when it is sort of shared via YouTube. And then the copyright holder has two uh, options. First, he or she can say, I want money for that, or can give it for free, or can block it. So three options. And that is what we would actually want for all I would say, protected works. And what we get instead is upload filters that will censor a lot of the stuff that we actually would like to circulate. So I think it's really a very unfortunate politics at the moment. And with regard to advertising and what Google invented here, I would say that is really a new generic new type of accumulation that we see here. What we see commodified is not only personal data in the traditional sense, it's much more by now. It's also human uh, senses, feelings, sort of um, affections, all sorts of stuff that, stuff that we might not even be aware of. And that is really scary and requires, I think, more than what we have got with uh, the copyright, uh, the data protection regulation from Europe. We need different instruments to deal with that because it goes beyond data protection in the sense of where you are asked to, to give away um, your personal data in exchange for a service. This is a model that describes the 1990s, but not what is coming. It really requires a new regime uh, to deal with. Other questions? <coughs> Anybody else? <coughs> Thank you very much. Jung Koch, I'm a historian. Um, I take your statement that it's not mainly technological change explaining what happened in the story you told, but uh, changes which can be influenced by legal structure, by social power, by bargaining, by politics. If that is so, comparison should be an interesting field to study because countries differ with respect to their legal arrangements, to their political systems, uh, to their traditions in this field as well. But you did not make really a comparative uh, s uh, story. You took Germany and the United States and sometimes even Scandinavian countries together. And basically in your story they are similar. I think you're right. but. Can we find other cases? Well, how, which cases would you propose, uh, which countries would you propose to compare in order to find out about the relative weight of legal, social and political factors uh, in ex as explanatory factors? What about China in this respect, which seems to follow uh, comparable technological uh, 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 constraints, but with a very different social, political, and cultural system. What about comparison in your story? One more 
Yes, I'm Brigitte Young, University of Münster, and I enjoyed your talk very much. But um, Herman, one of the things in your book, in terms of the subprime crisis, you focus so much more on global finance. And here we heard it's not technology is the driving force, but I wonder really about the driving force of finance. And that's what Jeanette was just saying right now, that we have a different system of accumulation. If what we had before, we had money being used, in fact, to produce goods. And put the, you sell those goods, you make more money. But what we have right now in whatever we call finance-dominated capitalism, you have money producing more money. And that seems to be much more the driving force. And so I wonder if the global finance is really... Uh, what a fundamental structural change in that would you very well try to explain. Okay. Nothing like saving the biggest and hardest questions till the end. Um, uh, we only have three minutes before we depart to have some more <laughs> wine and pretzels. Um, so I have to keep these short. Um, now, these are good questions. Um, so in the constraint of what was already a long talk, I homogenized some things. Analytically, from my point of view, the first step here is to um, understand differences among firms. And the reason to do that is um, we're in a capitalist economy, and capitalism is driven by profits and profit-seeking, and that occurs at the level of the firm. Um, and again, a footnote, most of the people I deal with in my professional life don't talk about profits. Um, most of the people I'm arguing, arguing against don't talk about profits. Yeah, if there's a new book out by Haskell and Westlake uh, on capitalism without capital, which is about intangibles, and the, the word profit appears um, approximately 20 times in that book, and it's um, in each instance talking about a specific firm, a few instances more broadly. Um, Robert Gordon's book, um, uh, if I remember correctly, profit does not even appear in the index. Robert Gordon wrote this very pessimistic book about American growth. So capitalism, profits, firms first. Now, it's also true that these firms are embedded in national economies. And it's true that the weight of certain kinds of firms differs across national economies. So this looks a lot like a US story, and that's because a very large percentage of those top-tier firms are U.S. Uh, in a legal sense. Um, and we could say uh, Germany uh, is much more of that kind of middle sector. And, and that's, by the way, why I'm here. So all of, those, all of you out there who know something about this, you will please tell me what you know. And those of you who know something about the Mittelstand, whether it's actually profitable or not, since I can't get that data out of CompuStat uh, or uh, Forbes or, or uh, Bureau Van Dyke. <laughs> Maybe you'll help me out. I won't say anything. You'll get a present later. Um, we, could, we could assign countries to types, but I'm very hesitant to do that because it's fundamentally, in my mind, about firms. Um, so that's point one. Point two is, yeah, the, the national level, however, does matter because these firms are embedded in different uh, uh, political structures, and it, it changes the dynamic. There is a huge, huge difference in the life chances of the bottom uh, third of the American population as compared to the bottom third of the German population, for example, because those Americans do not have reliable access to health insurance and therefore health care. It's not an issue here. It's not an issue in Scandinavia. So I might be in a heart's fear job, and I might not even be happy about being forced into a heart's fear job, but um, I have health insurance. I have some semblance of a pension. It makes for a different politics. Um, and that's, I think, as much as I'll say about that uh, right now, we maybe could have a longer conversation later. China, um, there is a global side of the story here because there is offshoring going on. Um, it's A, very difficult to get data on profitability of Chinese firms over the long term, and I think this is a long-term phenomenon. And B, it's difficult to get reliable data. The data on rich country firms in terms of profits already is in some sense often very shaky in terms of what we're actually getting conceptually. Uh, Chinese numbers, I don't want to touch. Um, the... Uh, 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 
Professor Young. The book with um, Randall Germain Carleton University in Canada, 2020, is on international money. So it's, it's in, on the horizon there. Um, the two things that link that argument, which I could talk another 40 minutes about, but you don't want, to uh, this project uh, is something like this. First, if you remember the finance slide, finance profitably, finance is one of the big collectors of profits. They don't do a lot of capital expenditure. So the question is, is this a, a phenomenon that's different from what I'm talking about, or is it similar? <laughs> Um, I would, I would make a str if I wanted to make a strong argument, I would say it's similar, and the reason is this. The ba Joe's Bank on the corner, or uh, in my, my hometown, the Albemarle uh, Trust uh, and Savings Bank, they don't make big money. They make the usual old middle class money. The big money is, of course, made by the investment banks and the, the big banks. Um, those banks have been very aggressive about, and here's the important word, patenting their derivatives. If you think about this, and this goes to the question also about what kind of accumulation regime we have, the pure information goods, um, quote unquote, want to be free in the sense that um, they're from a technical point of view, public goods, non-rival in consumption, non-excludable in access. Pure public goods are things like national defense, okay, clean air. You make one copy of iOS, you can make infinite numbers of copies. You make one copy of an MP3, you can make infinite numbers of copies. You can't make money off of that. You make money off of it by wrapping a property right around it. That's what intellectual property rights are. It's the same thing with these derivatives. Imagine a world in which these banks had to publish the formula for their derivatives, and anybody could copy it. You couldn't make money. First of all, nobody would use these derivatives because it would be clear that they're full of bombs. But second, you wouldn't be able to make money off of them because um, anybody could copy it. So the strong argument I'd make is that actually finance partakes of this phenomenon. But I'm happy to say that's probably possibly wrong. Um, the second connection is, um, that again, go back to that slide where 80%, 85% of stock market uh, capitalization is intangibles. Um, if you're a Hypothetically speaking, if you're a country that's running a 6 or 8% of GDP surplus with the world, hypothetically speaking, and, and you know, you're sending things out, you're selling goods and services to the rest of the world, if you're running a surplus, what you're getting back in return is assets created by other people. From your point of view, it's an asset. From their point of view, it's a liability. So, you, you, you know, it's kind of reasonable in the short run to give people, let's say, nice cars um, in exchange for pieces of paper. But you do that because you have some expectation that that piece of paper will have value in the future. Companies get money as cash. They don't sit on cash. They turn it into an asset. They buy something. They buy a government bond. They buy equities in the share market. They buy real estate. Ultimately, most of that money comes in the form of dollars. And when it goes back and buys American real estate, American um, T-bonds, part of the American stock market, um, what they're all gambling on is that Apple, Hilton, et cetera, will continue to make money because those companies are the bulk of growth in the US economy and they're the bulk of the stock market capitalization. Um, they're the bulk of the profits. So there's a very tight connection between international money flows and these companies. That's the connection. Thank you. I could listen to you all night. <laughs> so could I. <laughs> Thank you for some great questions. Thanks for your patience.